sick and tired of playing around with kids. I'm here to get it on with the big boys, and that means you. So this is Monday Night Raw 9-11, 1995 edition. All right, boys and girls, the wrestling world is about to change the way we see it today. As Raw, for the first time ever, will get some competition from WCW. As Monday Nitro is also on the air on TNT during the same exact show. But I believe that this show was taped in advance. At least this Monday Night Raw episode. Really quick, thoughts from what I've seen on WCW over the last year. I've been keeping up with this since about the Bash at the Beach of 1994. The wrestling in WCW, not as good. It's like they get the time, but there is no structure. Everything slow, methodical, and the end comes out of nowhere. I cannot tell you what half of these guys' finishers are because the matches usually ended up with interference and or a roll-up. The older wrestlers are in the main event. Hogan, Flair, Macho Man, those type of guys. And the main event feuds have been terrible over there. For their biggest event of the year at Starcade 1994, the main event was Hulk Hogan versus Brutus Beefcake, but he was known as the Butcher or whatever. Their tag team division is somehow worse than the WWF. While they do focus more on actual teams instead of put together ones, the matches are again just hard to watch. Bunch of shenanigans going on, which usually ended with the refs distracted, which, okay, it's a tag team match, so it makes sense, but they did it way too many times. The fact that I'm even acknowledging it can attest to how many times they've done it, especially the interference with managers. Obviously, in the WWF, you have the same thing. You know, Jim Cornette, Mr. Fuji, Harvey Whippleman, those type of guys, Ted DiBiase. But if Sensational Sherry and Colonel Parker aren't getting involved, it's not WCW. The mid-card scene is also all over the place. They have a TV title and a U.S. title. The TV title in the last year or so was on Arn Anderson, who was feuding with guys like Jim Duggan and Alex Wright. The United States Championship was vacated for a while. And Sting was feuding with a guy named Meng, also known as Haku. Mind you, they had and have guys like Helmsley, Pillman, Dustin Rhodes, Steve Austin, but instead used guys like Bunkhouse Bunk, Dave Sullivan, Jim Duggan, and Alex Wright. I know everything comes with time, but they had Austin and Helmsley for a good amount of time. Yeah, sure, they became who they became because of the Monday Night Wars, and you don't know what they could have done if they stayed in WCW, but what did you see in Alex Wright that you didn't see in Stone Cold Steve Austin. Structure and focus is going to be the main topic I keep going back to when talking about WCW. I was not watching back then because I wasn't old enough to know what a TV was, but watching back some of the old WCW pay-per-views and shows, I cannot tell you one match, feud, or card that I can genuinely say I go back to and watch from time to time. Like, you know, you go back to watch a couple Royal Rumble pay-per-views, some Survivor Series, obviously all the WrestleManias, for the most part, all the WrestleManias you can go back and watch. But yeah, it's not like the WWE where I can go back and watch, for example, Raw May 17th, 1993, when the 123 Kid beat Racer Ramon for the first time, and then also enjoy most of the other parts of the show. I can go back and watch Shawn Michaels versus Racer Ramon at WrestleMania 10. I can go back even recently and watch the feud between Sid and Diesel from WrestleMania 11 to the last in your house and be able to follow along and understand. With WCW, Everything was all over the place. Matches that you would think are decent are not. Like, you can have a... Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan was like their main event program for a while. And I cannot tell you one of those matches that I enjoyed sitting through and watching. I don't know what it was. But like, when Hogan was in the WWF, his matches with Randy Savage, Andre the Giant even, Roddy Piper. Like, you can go back and find something entertaining from those matches. But with that whole feud that he had with Ric Flair... I could really not recall one time that I sat through it, any of the matches, and I was like, I'm interested here. I'm, I might come back and watch this. Nope, it's in the past. I watched it. I never want to go back and see it again. Which, obviously, when the match doesn't live up to expectations, it always leaves the storyline, whatever it was, even if the storyline was great, it leaves it feeling flat. Like, they had Ric Flair versus Randy Savage in a decent little storyline built around Randy's father, who had been assaulted by Flair, but they had two matches. The first one was okay, but then their blow-off was a lumberjack match. Wasn't any good. Again, like, I don't know. And now Lex Luger is challenging Hulk Hogan for the belt. And obviously, I hate Lex Luger. I created a whole skip list because of him. That I get to skip all his matches. 
And he's going up against Hulk Hogan, who, at the time, he's not, you know, putting on technical masterpieces. So, Lex Luger versus Hulk Hogan, I can't see how any of those matches are going to be good either. And also, like, going back to the last review where Lex Luger did not come out with the British Bulldog, and I was kind of speculating on why. And I did watch the first Monday Night Wars episode. I'm going to be keeping up with that documentary, because I kind of want to see what is going on behind the scenes, you know what I mean? So, I did watch that first episode of the Monday Night War documentary, and Lex Luger said that he was at the house show the night before he debuted on Nitro, which, that makes sense. I thought he would have been gone way before that, but, no, I guess that's why it caught him off guard, so to speak. At least that's what everybody says. I thought that he would have been gone since SummerSlam, which was like three weeks ago. So, this is what they built this Nitro around, Hogan vs. Luger for the world title. And Monday Night Raw is built around Sid versus the winner of that ladder match from SummerSlam, who ended up being Shawn Michaels. So, now that I got the WCW business out of the way, the review will strictly now just be reviewing Monday Night Raw. Again, let me know if you want me to cover some of WCW on here, and I can turn this into a Monday Night War review. I'm uploading this months after I record this, so again, hopefully by mid-1996, I can get enough suggestions, hopefully, and go from there. If I don't get any suggestions... I'm just going to leave it as a Monday Night Raw only review. If anything of notice happens over there on one of those promotions, I'll try to cover it. Otherwise, like I said, sticking to WWF. So let's get to the actual Monday Night Raw review. We get promos for our two featured matches of the night. Sid vs. Shawn Michaels and Racer Ramon vs. the British Bulldog. Shawn and Racer had a hell of a ladder match at SummerSlam. I think their first match at WrestleMania 10 was better, but still worth going back to watch this ladder match at SummerSlam. But they also have a new intro and theme song for the show. I've never heard this theme song before, so it caught me off guard. If you care to hear it, go back to this episode and hear it for yourself. Because unlike clips for promos, if I play this song, it's going to get taken down. So, The first match of the show was Racer vs. the British Bulldog. And now since Lex is on WCW, Bulldog will be going solo. And Lex did appear in the main event for SummerSlam. Diesel knocked him out of the ring thinking that he was helping Mabel. But then Luger beat up Sir Moe. So, they kind of made you wonder where the Luger's alliance was. No pun intended. It doesn't matter now, but because this show was taped, let's see if they mention Lex in any way. We'll see when I uh, keep reading these notes, I guess. Racer also got in the face of Dean Douglas backstage at SummerSlam, so we're going to see if that comes into play here tonight. The British Bulldog also cut his hair, and he's in his long tights now. So, he's got a new look for his new attitude, so to speak. I like it when guys change their look and their attire when they either do a turn or they return from a long time away. It lets you know as a viewer that you're seeing something different. So, after getting beat down by Bulldog for a while, Racer catches him on the top and tosses him off, followed by a throwaway slam. Then he Irish whips Bulldog into the referee. Racer hits the Racer's edge. While Racer is covering the Bulldog, Shane Douglas comes out and lands a move from the top onto Racer's head. The 1-2-3 kid comes out for the save, but Douglas takes him out too. Then, Bulldog hits the power slam, but the kid also tries to move from the top rope, but it ends up nailing Racer with the splash, which leads to the referee ending the match via DQ. And then the Bulldog beats down the kid as well. Then, coming back from commercial, Vince interviews Racer and the kid, and there is some dissension here after Vince asks him what happened out there when the kid cost him the match. But the kid asks, what about when Racer came out on a different show and cost him a match? The kid challenges Racer to a match next week because he feels that he's been treating him like a child. And when your name is 123Kid, I mean, what do you expect? And the kid says that he's beaten him twice and he can do it again. Racer talks about his match against Sean. He talks about the Bulldog and Dean Douglas, the Bookworm. And now his buddy wants a match. So Racer says that if he wants it, if the fans want it, and if Vince wants it, we got it. So that match is coming. I'm down. We'll see what happens. Maybe that's going to lead up to the 1-2-3 kid turning heel. We'll see where they go there. Next up, we have the Smoking Guns versus some jobbers. They end up picking up the win with their tag team finisher. I think this is their third straight win on Raw. And I'm waiting for them to be announced as the new challengers for the tag team titles. After the Bulldog and Lex Luger, they were probably like the next person in line. So, yeah. And then because this is of importance, just because he was in the WWF recently too. On the other side of Nitro... We see formerly IRS, now going by VK Wall Street, and he was taking on Sting in his debut match. VK standing for Vincent Kennedy, I'm pretty sure. Luger, Nash, Jericho? No. 
the real betrayal was when IRS defected to the other side. And it happened on the first show. And then even though he ended up losing his match against Sting, everyone knew it was a war when the tax main crossed enemy lines. Next up on Raw, we have Isaac Yankum DDS making his Raw debut against the Jobber. He lost his match against Brett at SummerSlam via DQ. Not worth recapping that at all. The less said about that feud, the better. So yeah, hopefully Brett and Lawler are done with each other. Can someone explain why Yankum is still wrestling? If he's a dentist, why isn't he going back to that? He was just coming at SummerSlam to take out Brett for Jerry Lawler, so why is he still contracted to wrestle? But still, he's making his Raw debut with a win, so he's also in the running for the Dominance Award, standing at 1-0, at least on Raw. During the In Your House report, we got a couple of matches announced. Bam Bam Bigelow will be taking on the British Bulldog, Savio Vega vs. Waylon Mercy, and the triple header where all the titles are on the line, Yokozuna and Owen Hart vs. Shawn Michaels and Diesel. So I was wrong, Shawn Michaels and Diesel, I don't think they've been in a tag match since splitting up. So now the smoking guns have to wait behind them. Then we get our main event, Shawn Michaels vs. Sid. Before that, our homie, the guy that's been selling stuff, he's selling a Shawn Michaels hat and some other stuff. Can't knock the hustle at this point. Shawn is also backstage and he gets frightened after passing by a ladder. It was super subtle, if you blinked and you missed it. This match is 5 months in the making. Sid had attacked HBK and put him out for weeks after WrestleMania 11, but because Sid was challenging for the WWF title, this match was put on the back burner. It was going to happen originally at SummerSlam, but they decided to wait and do the ladder match instead. Only after this match is over can I tell you if they made the right decision. Strong gets overpowered as you would imagine for the beginning of the match, almost gets countered out which would have helped him as he would have retained the belt, but babyface Sean isn't letting that happen. Sid stops a comeback quickly with a choke slam. Sean backbody drops Sid after a power bomb attempt. He hits a crossbody for a near fall. Then he super kicks the tummy, which gets Sid crouched over, and then he hits the super kick to the face. And then he hits another super kick when the big man is dazed to knock him down and out for the victory. We had the pose down from Hogan in the 80s, but it's nothing compared to Sean strip teasing after all his victories. He goes to the back to catch up with Diesel. Doc Hendricks comes in to stir up some hypothetical situations regarding their match against the tag team champions. Listen to Shawn Michaels sell us on the match, and then Diesel fucks it up with a terrible line. In case you haven't noticed, Doc, the heartbreak kid is in the process of righting all the wrongs in his life. First starting with my reuniting with my big buddy, Big Daddy Cole Diesel, putting the IC strap back around my waist. And of course, with SummerSlam, avenging the most horrific loss of my career at WrestleMania 10. And now, finally, Putting down Psycho Sid with a little chin music. It is all over with, and it is time for Big Daddy Cool and the Heartbreak Kid to move on to bigger and better things. And the triple header, and in your house, is where we're gonna start. You know, so we're so used to making history, I can't help it. I think we gotta do it again. You know, we're not only two dudes with attitudes, but we're two chaps with all the strengths. I'm telling you this, if I had just a percentage of Sean's confidence and his presence, I would never ask for anything else in my life. I think I would be set. So yeah, this episode is going to get a good grade for me. Started off with a decent match, and it leads us to a match I'm looking forward to with Racer and the Kid. The middle was kind of just there, but then we get a good match to end the show. So yeah, I was doing a side-by-side watch along with Nitro and Raw. To be honest with you, besides when I saw Sabu and when Flair came out to cut a promo, there was no other moment I would have switched the channel for back in the day. Hogan vs. Luger might have gotten a casual viewer's attention for the main event, but because I don't like Luger and I think Sean is already top 5 all time, and I'm saying that at the time, like 1995 Sean is already top 5 all time in the WWF. So obviously I'm going to favor Raw over Nitro 9 out of 10 times twice on Sunday. But yeah, with that being said, again, starting next week, less of WCW and more on keeping it strictly to WWF. But yeah, I'm done with the review. I am out.